Welcome everyone, bienvenue. Uh, my name is Ryan Katsrozin and uh, I'm a professor at the School of Political Studies and the Institute of Environment here at the University of Ottawa. And on behalf of the Center for International Policy Studies, I'm really pleased to welcome you to tonight's public debate, do we need to scale up nuclear power to combat climate change? This is a, a great turnout. So thank you to everyone who came out uh, in person. And we've got, uh, I'm told, hundreds of people, uh, 400 re uh, registered uh, people online who are watching on the live stream. So welcome to those who are watching uh, from home. I don't quite know where to look, but uh, welcome. Uh, to those of you here in the audience, uh, please do note that the event is being live streamed and filmed uh, for a virtual audience. And the plan is to post the recording of the debate on SIPS's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Uh, cet événement, uh, c'est en anglais seulement, mais pour ceux qui sont sur le Zoom, uh, les transcriptions professionnelles sont uh, disponibles. I'd like to start off uh, the evening by acknowledging that the University of Ottawa is located on the traditional, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. Aside from acknowledging the land, I also want to acknowledge that the key themes centered in uh, tonight's debate, climate change and nuclear energy, both carry very important implications for Indigenous peoples in Canada and for reconciliation. So why nuclear power and why climate change and why a public debate? This is a topic which has only gotten more heated as the world itself has continued to warm. Earlier today, I was reading about how the world's oceans are now warmer than they've been for any year for which we have reliable records and likely warmer than they've been for over a thousand years. Correspondingly, forecasters predict that it's quite likely that the world's average temperature will again break records, if not this year, then the next. The science is very clear. Climate change is real. It's being exacerbated by human activity and it's an extremely urgent problem. If we want to keep the level of global warming to less than two degrees Celsius from pre-industrial baselines, then the world will have to stop emitting carbon dioxide and dramatically reduce emissions of other greenhouse gases. Moreover, we will most likely also have to remove additional carbon from the atmosphere. Both of our debaters today will likely be in agreement uh, that we need to phase out fossil fuels from our energy supply, while simultaneously turning increasingly towards electrification and carbon-free forms of electricity. And therein lies the energy and climate challenge, since more than 80% of the world's energy supply is currently derived from fossil fuels. So from where should we source this clean energy? And here is where our debaters disagree. I don't think it's controversial to say that nuclear power offer, offers tremendous uh, promise and potential, but its promise is not without risk or cost. And that's why we're here today to hear from two experts who have invested countless hours in this topic and arrived at differing positions regarding the role of nuclear power in a swift, just, and sustainable energy transition. And it's our role as citizens to take the time to learn about this stuff, to take in the arguments, to let them stew, to think critically about them, and then apply them to our civic lives however we see fit. So I'm really excited to hear uh, a respectful and well-informed debate about this topic and to hearing our panelists' uh, responses to your questions during the, the Q&A. There's a few final things to note before I turn it over to our moderator. This event, uh, simply would not be possible without the support of the Center for International Policy Studies, and in particular, its very hardworking coordinator, Anna Bojic, who's at the back. Thank you, Anna. Really... Some of you don't know that Anna actually coordinates two of the centers here at the university, so it's uh, very much appreciated. I also want to thank Susan O'Donnell, for her role in helping to organize this event and for coming up with an idea to host an event of this nature. Uh, so thank you, Susan. So let me now introduce my colleague, uh, Patricia Fuller, who will be moderating tonight's debate. Patricia Fuller is a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, 
She has extensive experience in international relations and public policy. She served as Canada's ambassador to Chile and to Uruguay, and has served posts in Mexico and Guatemala, as well as numerous other posts within the federal government here in Canada. Notably, Patricia was Canada's ambassador for climate change from 2018 to 2021. Patricia, I'm gonna turn it on to you and thank you for agreeing to moderate tonight's panel. Hey, thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. And, and thank you to all of you for being here. Welcome. As, as Ryan has said, there is, I think, a, a fairly broad consensus that we need to rapidly scale up clean energy to meet this climate challenge. But certainly divergent views and even chatting with you in, in the few minutes before we got started, diverging views on the role that nuclear energy should play in that, uh, in that challenge. So we're fortunate to have two experts here and I'll briefly introduce them. You have their bios in the, in the uh, announcement for the session. <clears throat> Dr. Gordon Edwards is president and co-founder of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, a not-for-profit corporation established in 1975. He's a retired professor of math and science at Vanier College in Montreal, and has been a consultant on nuclear issues for government and non-government uh, uh, bodies for over 45 years. Uh, he served as an expert witness in US and Canadian courts and tribunals and is frequently invited to testify before provincial and federal bodies. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chris Kiefer is a Toronto-based emergency physician and the president of the grassroots nonprofit Canadians for Nuclear Energy. He is also the host of the Decouple podcast, which explores the science, technology, and politics of energy transition. And uh, Dr. Kiefer's activism extends beyond nuclear energy to issues of indigenous, migrant, and refugee health. For example, he co-founded one of Canada's first seasonal agricultural workers health clinics. So uh, two wonderful experts here. Uh, this is not uh, the debaters on CBC where we'll have a applause and select a winner. Our, our goal here today is to illuminate the issues and all leave this room smarter and more informed ab about, uh, uh, about nuclear energy. And so the format will be five minutes for uh, opening remarks, starting with Chris and then going to Gordon. And then we'll have a dialogue uh, that I will moderate with our, our two speakers. Uh, and then they will provide three minutes of closing remarks, after which we'll have a Q&A session with, uh, with you, the audience here in this room. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we'll keep time here to make the most of the time we have together. And I'll ask uh, Chris to lead off with his opening remarks. Okay, it's wonderful to be here today um, in this big, beautiful, bright room um, and see the audience, I think, fairly integrated. I think this is such a polarizing issue. Um, you'd almost expect there to be a line down the middle and the pros on one side and the antis on the other. So I think the debate is maturing a lot um, and I'm really glad to see that. Um, so you guys might be puzzled um, because you've certainly heard of what an anti-nuclear activ activist is to you know, be sitting in front of a, uh, a pro-nuclear activist and you know that might take a little bit of explaining on my part. Um, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. Um, but maybe a little more on the on the personal side. Um, I first became really interested in the climate question around the time of the birth of my son, who's now four years old. Um, he's mischievous, inquisitive, really lovely, the greatest accomplishment of my life. Um, but we start thinking differently about time when we have children um, and the time frames ex extend well into the future and climate change is going to have a major impact on, on him and his generation. And that really caused me um, to go deep into investigating questions of climate change and ultimately solutions and energy. Um, you know, why am I passionate about nuclear energy? Um, I think there's a lot of, um, I'll call it misinformation and we're going to have some disagreements about that up here tonight. 
Um, nuclear has played a, a really massive role in Ontario in terms of air pollution. Um, I've been a physician working through the coal phase out, um, which occurred uh, between around 2005 and 2014. 90% um, of the electricity we required to phase out coal, um, which has been called North America's greatest greenhouse gas reduction, was provided by nuclear energy. Um, and we saw smog days in Toronto go from 54 to zero over the course of that. So in my clinical practice, I've certainly seen a huge improvement from air quality. I love living in Toronto and it no longer being the, the big smoke. I remember not seeing the stars. I remember the light pollution even off of the smog was horrible when I was younger. Um, I do want to extend my respect uh, to Gordon. Um, you've been at this a lot longer than I have. Um, your stamina is uh, a miracle to behold. I think this is your fourth event this week. You've been working away across Northern Ontario. Um, I hope to have a fraction of that um, as I head through my 40s. We have a lot of similarities, I think. Um, we're both driven by a genuine concern for health, for the environment, um, and for climate. Um, I think we both agree um, that across this entire life cycle, nuclear is an ultra low carbon source of energy. I think the last similarity we have is we both have the gift of the gab. <laughs> and it's going to be a bit of a challenge for you, potentially, Patricia. So, I mean, that brings us to our differences. Um, we have very differing opinions on this matter. I think it's going to be exciting to hear those and explore those tonight. Um, at worst, um, on my side, I might be being overly complacent. Um, about the risks of nuclear power. Um, at worst, on, on Gordon's side, um, you know, he may be spreading fear about a vital tool um, to fight air pollution, uh, climate change, and medicine. So when it comes to this proposition of do we need nuclear, do we need to scale it up to fight climate change, for me it's an unabashed yes. I am not alone in this opinion. Um, I'm joined by the godfather of climate scientist himself, Dr. James Edward Hansen. Um, the whole number of, of quite prominent figures, George Monbiot, um, one of the UK's most famous environmentalists and a, and a, uh, a Guardian um, a writer, but also interestingly, I think very interestingly, by folks that are most well acquainted with the world's greatest nuclear energy accident, which was Chernobyl. Uh, Dr. Geraldine Thomas, uh, molecular pathologist at Imperial College London, director of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, is actually very much in favor of scaling up nuclear energy because of an assessment of the risks and the benefits and the alternatives. Another one, Robert, Dr. Robert Gale, one of the most preeminent hematology oncologists invited by Premier Gorbachev to treat uh, the victims of acute radiation syndrome from Chernobyl. Again, assessing the risks, benefits, and alternatives is supportive of a scale up of nuclear energy. And so you, you've heard my framing there, risks, benefits, and alternatives. And I think that's how we have a mature discussion about this topic. I do that every single day um, when I'm discussing treatments and investigations with my patients in the emergency department. And ultimately, we have a sick climate, and we have to look at the treatments that are available, um, and we need to make some mature decisions about that. Um, I, I just want to close by saying, you know, Dr. Evers is going to have his, his chance to speak in a moment, but from what I understand, his position is far more radical and extreme um, than simply saying we shouldn't scale up nuclear energy. My understanding is he believes that we should phase out nuclear energy as quickly as possible. That's out of line with even folks like Greta Thunberg, who said regarding the German nuclear closures that it's a mistake to shut down the nuclear plants while they focus on coal. Well, the last three German nuclear plants have been shut down and have been replaced by coal. It's a pretty extraordinary story. Mike Schreiner, leader of the Green Party of Ontario, also supports running our nuclear assets in Ontario at least till their end of life. Doesn't support refurbishing them or new nuclear, but I think there's, there's something to Dr. Edwards' opinion, which is going beyond um, you know, a lot of what the mainstream environmental movement is saying. I think I'll probably leave it at that because I'm running out of time. But again, looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Chris. All right, Gordon, over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to phrase my own views and rather than having somebody else phrase them. Um, it's, it's simply not true that I have ever advocated phasing out things instantly or as quickly as possible. I am in favor of phasing out nuclear power for very good reasons, which I'd like to explain, but I'm particularly concerned about the rush right now to build a whole new generation of nuclear reactors when, uh, except for four reactors that were ordered in the Southern United States, 
There has not been a single other reactor ordered in North America since before 1978. So there's been a 30 year of a very long drought in reactor sales. And in fact, the, the globally, the actual role of nuclear in the world, meeting the world's energy needs has been in a rather sharp decline. 25 years ago, uh, nuclear provided 17% of the world's electricity. Uh, today, it's less than 10% and still going down. And uh, even if they build new reactors fairly quickly, it's going to continue to go down for at least the next 10 or 20 years because uh, the older reactors, of which most of, them, most of them are quite old, are going to be shut down faster than the new ones will be built. So um, it's really a question here of whether the climate change is an emergency or not. And I believe it is an emergency. And the main reason it's an emergency is because our politicians have been dragging their heels for such a long time, decades and decades. So um, when you're in an emergency situation, you have to do what gives you the quickest results. Uh, it's like triage in medicine, I suppose. You have to deal with the patient immediately when they're in a dire situation. Um, now, with, with regard to the climate emergency, the problem is that nuclear power is at least four times more expensive than renewable energies and at least four times slower to deploy. So that means that in combination, uh, you could build 16 times the renewable energy capacity in the same, with the same money and the same amount of time as building nuclear equivalents. I think that you have to deal with the emergency as an emergency. You have to work fast to reduce carbon emissions. And we can't afford to wait another couple of decades to start making a change. You have to realize that when nuclear reactors are planned and under construction, under licensing and so on, nothing is being done about greenhouse gases. And so if it takes 15 years, 18 years, even 10 years, it's already too late because you have been just been increasing greenhouse gas emissions all that time. With efficiency, energy efficiency is the number one thing we have to do. As a matter of fact, this was clearly laid out under President Jimmy Carter. When he was first ascended to office, he set up what's called the Solar Energy Research Institute. And he asked the Solar Energy Research Institute to find out the feasibility of meeting 80% of America's electricity needs, energy needs by solar energy. And when, the, when his term was done, the report was ready and uh, it was called a new prosperity. And what it said is that yes, it is possible for solar energy to, to meet those needs without anything new than what we already had at that time. But the key is energy efficiency. We have to have an energy efficient, energy conscious, energy conserving society. We have to move towards a society that is more sustainable in itself. Canadians are very wasteful in energy. North Americans generally are, and humans as a, as a whole are. But with energy efficiency and renewables, it's a winning combination. Now, um, it might be interesting for you to know that the International Energy Agency, and you can check this out on the website, uh, predicts that uh, in the next five years, 90% of new electricity generation installed worldwide is going to be renewable, not nuclear. So there we can have a very fast uh, um, answer to the emergency. I use a parallel sometimes that when your house is on fire, you need to pour water on it to put out the fire. You've got to get that fire out. You can't sit around at that point trying to devise a fancy uh, sprinkler system for the next house you're going to build. So I, I, I think that, uh, that, uh, that just the timing is wrong for, renew for nuclear. Uh, you might know that uh, Germany closed its last three nuclear power plants out of 17 in... Uh, Germany closed its last three nuclear power plants on April the 15th. That was 17 reactors that were shut down. And um, they have since been exporting energy, electricity, to France, which is the Saudi Arabia of nuclear energy, because more than half of France's 54 nuclear reactors have been down during that last year period. And so uh, Germany has been selling electricity to France 
selling electricity to Switzerland, selling electricity to Austria as a way of overcoming some of the shortages that were imposed by the Ukrainian war launched by Russia. Germany is still uh, on the road towards phasing out coal completely by 2038. And there's no reason to think they're gonna miss that target because they met their nuclear shutdown target very, very well. Thank you, Gordon. That's great for the opening. And I wanna ask Chris to go into uh, one of the issues that you raised, which is uh, the speed of deployment question. So let's delve into that a little bit. You said, Gordon, that, that nuclear energy is uh, four times slower to deploy. And uh, as you point out, we're in an emergency. So Chris, can yeah. nuclear energy be scaled up if, and we'll get to the other issues, don't worry, safety and so on, we'll get to those. But just as a theoretical possibility, can nuclear energy be scaled up at the time uh, scale that we need? So this isn't a theoretical question. This is a question um, that has been proven. So right here in Ontario, again, 61% of our electricity is from nuclear. How long did it take to build our fleet? We commissioned 20 large candy reactors in 22 years. Let's talk about France for a second. 56 reactors commissioned in 15 years, decarbonizing their electricity grids. You'll hear a lot about four times faster. We, we produce a lot of wind and solar. That's true. But Germany is still reliant. Its number one source of electricity is coal and it has replaced its nuclear plants with coal. This is not something to be celebrated. And, you know, Gordon, if it's true that you don't support the immediate shutdown of nuclear, it's curious, I wonder why or if you support the German shutdown, because it is a, it is a disaster for the climate. And we're gonna be talking about all sorts of different health impacts and things like that. But um, coal plants are, you know, the big bugaboo of climate change. So, you know, can it be done quickly? Absolutely, it can. Why has it not been happening recently? We haven't been seeing an increase in demand. Gordon is absolutely right. Energy efficiency is key. However, we're talking about electrifying everything. The consensus there is we need, even with efficiency, to double or triple our electricity grid. When we were growing our grid rapidly here in Ontario, we quickly exhausted our hydroelectricity at Niagara Falls. We started building a lot of coal the biggest coal plant in North America, in Nanticoke, these big eight boiler units, um, extraordinary things. And we made a, a decision in the 70s to try nuclear. And we did an amazing job of it. And we built those nuclear plants instead of coal plants. Pickering was supposed to be another whopper like Nanticoke, a four gigawatt coal plant. So if you wanna talk about climate solutions and lives saved from avoided air pollution, um, nuclear is certainly on the table. Um, and it can be done quickly. The demand is there now, and that's why nuclear is back on the table. You don't invest in really expensive capital intensive infrastructure like bridges, like hydro dams, if they're not going to get used. And it's true, the last 20 years, you know, you build that thing and maybe you wouldn't be able to sell those kilowatt hours. But now the emerging consensus is we need to grow the grid so that we can not only mitigate climate change, but adapt to it. You know, elderly people, mentally ill people die in heat waves. They need air conditioning that requires energy desalination. I mean, it's endless what we're going to need energy for. We'll need more energy to adapt to climate change. That's, that's just a reality. That, that I think we were all in massive agreement on we need more clean energy. So just so I understand, Chris, you're saying that a nuclear reactor could be, be built in how many years? So the global average has been eight years eight around years. the world. Japan, okay. Japan so. has achieved the numbers of every four years. Once we get into good practice, as we have with our candy refurbishments, we're currently refurbishing probably our entire fleet because it looks like we'll be refurbishing Pickering. Those are mega projects. They're hard to do well, but we're learning how to do them well. They're ahead of schedule and on budget. And that gives me a lot of confidence that we can move into building nuclear quickly. The best time to build it was 10 years ago. Second best so. time is now. That's a figure for you, eight years is global average. Gordon, let me ask you perhaps whether you would agree with that as a data point first. And secondly, uh, I think it's important in this debate that we're talking about alternatives. So it's everything has its problems, everything has its drawbacks. So if you could compare it in terms of deployment to uh, the kind of timeframes to, to build equivalent energy resources uh, in Canada. Is that on? Yeah. Okay. 
There have been no new no nuclear power reactors built in Canada ordered since 1978. So this is ancient history where these reactors were built. The only reactors in North America that have been ordered in recent times is uh, are the four reactors in the southern United States, the so-called Volcal reactors. Um, two of those reactors, they're AP1, AP1000, they're 1000 megawatt reactors, which is a little larger than the CANDU reactors and about three times as large as uh, the small modular reactor they're now planning to build at Darlington. But two of those reactors were so slow and so costly that they were shut down and abandoned after spending $9 billion on the construction, they were abandoned. Those were in uh, South Carolina. The two others in Georgia, the price went from $12 billion to currently $28 billion. And they still have not really started producing electricity. And that period of time was 13 years. So 13 years for that particular, the, the, the latest example of reactors in North America. Um, in Finland, they had a, a reactor that was ordered from Arriva, and it took 18 years to bring that reactor online, even though it was supposed to be come online far sooner. So these are promises that are not being kept in terms of rapidly building these reactors, and they're not being experienced. With regard to um, um, the small modular reactors we're talking about are unproven, they're untested. We've had small reactors built in Canada. The maple reactors never worked, not for a single day. They had to be decommissioned after being constructed because they never worked. There was a slowpoke district heating reactor, a failure. It was never operated either. It couldn't get a license to operate. So we've had John T1 in uh, Quebec, which was a small reactor never operated for more than 180 days. And then it was decommissioned after that. These new reactors are novel. Some of them are using uh, um, fluids for cooling that are very hazardous. For example, liquid sodium in, in New Brunswick. Liquid sodium reactors have been tried in the United States. It led to a meltdown at the Fermi-1 reactor and they abandoned it. In France, the Super Phoenix turned out to be a fiasco, liquid sodium cooled. They abandon it. Anybody who knows about sodium knows that it's explosive on contact with water and it readily burns in air and they have problems with sodium fires and safety for that. So these new reactors are not guaranteed to work. They're generally coming in at, a, at a highly elevated prices. The price escalates to two or three or even four times the cost that was originally anticipated and uh, the delays are legendary. So uh, I, I don't think that this is a way that we should be going in an emergency. And particularly, we should not be investing in technologies that don't even address the, uh, the current problems, such as in New Brunswick, they're wanting to build a small modular reactor that will use plutonium extracted from can-do fuel. This has nothing to do with fighting climate change because uh, this, this whole move towards using plutonium is a nightmare regarding the weapons connection. If we export such reactors around the world, it means that many countries that do not now have access to plutonium will have access to plutonium through our technology. Just as we gave a reactor to India and they used their plutonium from that reactor for their first atomic bomb. I believe that there's more than one existential crisis facing the planet. Climate change is one, but nuclear annihilation through nuclear weapons and the, the uh, uh, uncontrolled spread of them is another. Okay, and so we'll, we'll try to take so that's a whole one other issue connection. at a time here. So uh, I don't know that we've illuminated on the question of timelines. You're saying eight years. You're saying it's always been much longer in North America. But maybe we'll, we'll set that aside for the moment and move to the question of cost. And Chris, I'll ask perhaps I think it would be useful given that Gordon has mentioned SMRs. Uh, you've talked about large-scale reactors. So... Perhaps you could just tell us two things. One is, are you advocating for, uh, and we're talking, I guess, in the Canadian context, um, extension and more large-scale reactors or also SMRs? And then uh, if you could address the question of, of, of cost, because certainly that is, I think, a fairly widely held con conception that nuclear energy would be much more expensive than renewable energy. 
For sure, for sure. And I mean, just to clarify, Gordon's examples are, are cherry picking. It's true that the most recent builds in North America, but the reasons why is because we had supply chains that were completely uh, inactive and atrophied workforces that were not familiar with nuclear anymore because they hadn't built a reactor, as Gordon was saying, for 20 or 30 years. That's not the case here in Canada where our workforce is teed up. Our supply chain is totally ready because we're rebuilding our Canada reactors one after the other. Um, so I anticipate the costs will be, uh, will be uh, very acceptable, but we'll get to that. In terms of small modular reactors, this term, um, it's not very precise. I don't really like it because um, it's this huge basket. As Gordon's saying, it's a whole variety of different technologies, um, which will probably go over most people's heads, you know, sodium cooled, molten, molten salt, all this stuff. You know, when it comes down to it, we're talking about the scale. And I think that's what's important. Do we need both? Yes, because we have small grids in this country as well. We have Saskatchewan, Alberta, Nova Scotia, all places that are burning coal still, right? Um, and a great place for it to just transition coal workers and coal communities to very similar jobs as we did here in Ontario. Um, you know, I've interviewed some really impressive folks who used to work at Nanticoke who now work in better, better paying jobs, better working conditions um, over in a nuclear plant. Um, so when it comes to the cost though, I think this is really interesting. Um, the the, the uh, inflation adjusted cost of our can-do build out here in Ontario was $55.4 billion. Sounds like a lot, right? Well, our Green Energy Act solar and wind contracts of the last 15 to 20 years have the price tag of $60 billion by the time that their lifespan expires, okay? The, the can-do fleet has produced 3,300 terawatt hours to date. By the end of the lifespan of the wind and solar we've installed in the last 15 or 20 years, they'll have produced 200 terawatt hours. That's 16 times less for essentially the same cost. And value, the value of the energy that we get out of our nuclear fleet is very high because we can match it to demand. You have to remember that electricity is not a commodity. You don't go and say, hey, I'd like 150 electrons today from the grocery store and bring it home and use it in your home. It's like healthcare. And wind and solar are very cheap when, when the weather's cooperating. It's kind of like if you had really cheap doctors and nurses in your hospital that would work for almost free. They won't work a night shift if they're the solar panels and they won't work when the weather's not nice and weather's kind of iffy in Canada, if you haven't noticed. And so it, it's a way that actually it's cheap to build when the weather's right, it's very cheap, but you're paying for a service, not a commodity. And just as healthcare would be very expensive if you had these ultra cheap doctors and nurses that didn't work very much, but you had to provide that service overnight. You'd have to pay expensive on-call doctors to cover the system at the other times. And that's what we end up doing with wind and solar. And that's why if you look around the world where they've, where they've um, deployed the most wind and solar in places like Germany and California, Germany, highest electricity prices in Europe, California, the, the lead deployer of renewables, highest cost of electricity in the continental US. So something's not making sense here. The developers are making a fortune, private developers mostly, Whereas our crown corporation, our publicly owned nuclear assets are providing the second cheapest source of electricity on our grid after hydroelectricity. I went on too long, I'm sorry, okay, Patricia. No, no, that's fine, that's okay. fine. Uh, Gordon, if you could respond on the uh, cost uh, yeah. uh, data that, that Chris presented. And then if you could also address the question of reliability of the grid, because this is uh, certainly comes up, uh, I would say most frequently is one of the arguments right. for nuclear energy as a dispatchable source of energy that uh, many people say is right. required in order for grids to be reliable, because, you know, we have to keep in mind cost, reliability, security. So, please. Okay. Well, if you look at, uh, if you look at the uh, Wall Street people who assess costs of energy, you'll find that the Lazard company has published figures on the cost and nuclear is always at the top level of uh, cost for energy production. So um, I think that, uh, that we have to realize that I'm a little confused by what Chris Kiefer is saying because he's talking about our Crown Corporation. None of the reactors that are currently being touted for Canada are connected to a Crown Corporation in terms of origin. They're all small modular reactors. One of them is a micromodular reactor at Chalk River. One of them is a liquid sodium cooled reactor in New Brunswick. Another is a molten salt cooled reactor. And then there's a boiling water reactor, which is American design, uh, which being planned for Darlington. So when, when Chris is talking about uh, can do and the uh, um, 
uh, crown corporations, this seems to be a misfit with what's actually happening today. These are US and UK companies who are selling their products here in Canada. And we are going to be facing the problems of the waste management and the uh, decommissioning costs of these reactors because the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission has stated that it does not want to deal with those costs until the, the reactor is running. And at the end of life, then they will address the cost. But that's too late because you have to assess those costs up front. Remember that three generations of electricity from a nuclear reactor results in 300,000 generations of toxic waste management. And the costs of these are quite considerable. 26 billion, for example, is estimated for the cost of the existing waste. And these new reactors that are being planned right now are going to have waste which are more difficult. They're going to be a number more radioactive than can do fuel. And they're going to be more difficult to manage than can do fuel. Those costs are not being assessed. So we have a problem there. Turning to renewables, it's true that they need storage. And in fact, storage is a key component of any energy source because the transportation sector, for instance, if you talk about electrifying everything, you cannot have electrical vehicles without good energy storage. And energy storage technology benefits renewables far more than it benefits nuclear because nuclear can go 24 seven. Renewables are admittedly interruptible but with good storage, they are much cheaper. So uh, anything that improves the transportation sector and improves storage is going to improve the relative position of renewables relative to nuclear. I, I do want to point out, however, that the, the big thing about nuclear energy is the what you don't see up front. The, the, Chris is talking about the energy supply and the reliability while it's operating but there is all the costs that uh, come afterwards. And those costs include the nuclear waste. They include the decommissioning costs. Billions of dollars have to be set aside for that. And they also include the threat of radioactive, uh, uh, sorry, nuclear proliferation, proliferation of nuclear weapons. Plutonium is produced in every one of these reactors. Every one of them produces plutonium, not found in nature. Plutonium is the key nuclear explosive in the world's nuclear arsenals. If you rely on nuclear to combat climate change, you'll be spreading nuclear throughout the world. And that means that countries that don't have plutonium now will have their own plutonium supply. It's, it would have to be, you'd have to be living in Alice in Wonderland to think that this is not going to result in the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries. Particularly with the example of Russia invading Ukraine and threatening to use nuclear weapons, more countries are now nervous about the fact that they do not have nuclear weapons. You remember, in fact, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for security. So uh, uh, countries are now more impelled to try and get their own nuclear. In fact, South Korea has recently announced that they may consider that as a, as a strategy for the country. So let's stay for a moment on the issue of the reliability of the grid. So Gordon has indicated that with energy storage, uh, grid reliability can be achieved without nuclear energy. I hope I'm summarizing reasonably <laughs> the point. Uh, so Chris, how would you respond to that? Do we need it? If we don't need it, then why do it, I think? Absolutely, wind and solar require storage. Unfortunately, that storage is natural gas and coal. Okay, Germany is one of the richest countries in the world, uh, fourth largest economy, 14th wealthiest country in the world. They put 14, sorry, they put $400 billion into a wind and solar based energy transition. Coal is the number one source of electricity on their grid, 31% of their electricity. And even before the Russian invasion, when they replaced Russian gas, which got cut off with even more coal, it was still the number one source on their grid. And this is 10, 15 years in as they're shutting down their nuclear feed. I'd really like, you know, give Gordon a few minutes here, but I'd really like to know because he said he's not for the immediate shutdown and I was putting words in his mouth, um, what he actually feels about the German situation because there's been a massive return to coal there. A few things, because Gordon has covered a lot of territory. I'm not gonna, don't worry. We'll, we'll, I think we have opportunities to touch, touch and eat subject as we go. Lazard actually just released another report recently, which was the cost of wind and solar plus firming, plus batteries. We don't have enough lithium in the world. 
we don't have enough batteries in the world to back up wind and solar. And that's why we use natural gas and coal to do it. Nuclear works great with storage. Actually, a lot of nuclear plants were built with pump storage next, by, next, next door. And the great thing about nuclear plus storage is that how long you need to store for is a 24 hour cycle. With wind and solar, it's months, it's seasonal. I'll remind you during our summer heat waves here in Ontario, you might notice, but there's no wind blowing that sweat off your brow. Our solar, uh, sorry, our wind fleet was operating at 6% capacity factor for two weeks last year during our hottest heat waves when our grid demand is maxed out, okay? Solar disappears for about four months of the year in the winter. These are not well matched to the Canadian climate. Solar performs better in places like Australia, or Arizona, frankly. So we have to be realistic about that. With the firming costs factored in, Lazard is saying wind and solar start to approach the price of Vogel that nuclear plant in the US that's gone so over budget. So I'd encourage you to look at the latest Lazard data, um, Dr. Edwards, I think, I think you'd learn a lot from it. Um, I think that's all I need to say. I mean, obviously we brought up the, the issue of the cost of decommissioning, um, the cost of waste management. You know, it's incredible that nuclear is still the second cheapest source of electricity when it's actually putting money aside for that, right? So that 26 billion to build a deep geologic repository, that money has been, it's sitting in account, in an account, gaining interest, waiting to be used. The decommissioning funds are there. No other source of electricity um, factors that in. You know, there's no plan to recycle millions and millions and millions of, of solar panels. There's no plan to recycle wind turbines. Um, so, you know, this is why it's about risks, benefits, and alternatives. And I don't think we should be up here fetishizing a technology or being partisan about it, um, but we need to assess it based on the goals. And, you know, my aim here is to tell you what, what my goals are personally, and hopefully you can see a logic behind, you know, what I'm advocating for. Okay, so Gordon, could you respond on the points of reliability that, that Chris has made that, that uh, we can't rely on renewable energy for its intermittency? In, in Canada in particular. Uh, and also uh, let's try to clarify on the cost question and, and the, the Lazar report, which includes that firming element, which I understand to be the, the cost you need to build in for, the, mm -hmm. for storage or whatever kind of backup power would be needed to make it reliable. Okay, well, I, I do think that we're, you're kind of confusing backup and storage. Backup and storage are not the same thing. Uh, backup is, is to, for an, another energy source to cover over the rough times. And it's not true to say that, uh, that the storage is, uh, is another energy source. The storage is any system that will store that energy, whether it's pump storage, whether it's batteries, or whether it's something else. Now, one of the things that people often forget about uh, solar energy is it doesn't have to be electrical. For example, in Montreal, we have some old uh, unused, disused uh, grain elevators. These grain elevators uh, are massive. And if you fill these with water, there's a couple of uh, in, uh, architects uh, won a prize for their uh, design for downtown Montreal. If you filled these grain elevators with water and used seasonal solar energy, to heat that water to a very high temperature, you could then heat all of uh, old Montreal from those, uh, from those reservoirs uh, without using electricity. With regard to uh, the, the demand for more and more electricity as we electrify, that too is a little misleading. In Montreal, for example, in Quebec rather, Quebec, we have a lot of electrical resistance heating. Now, if that electrical resistance heating were replaced by heat pumps, the amount of saved electricity would be enough to run the entire transportation sector of Quebec. So the fact, the fact that you need more electrical applications does not mean you necessarily need a comparable amount of new electricity generation. What you need is to use the energy in a much smarter way. And one of the problems with nuclear is that it sort of opens the door to unlimited excesses. This is what's happened in the past and it's likely to happen again in the future. We have to learn how to live more efficiently. We have to learn how to use energy more wisely and we have to use the energy income we have rather than squander the energy capital. The energy capital, which is expressed in fossil fuels, for example, buried in the ground is finite. The energy capital for nuclear is uranium also buried in the ground, which is finite. 
the thing about renewables is that they are renewable and that they are inexhaustible. And if we, if there are other renewables that haven't even begun to be tapped, such as uh, geothermal energy. So I think that reliability is a function of experience. We have to develop these technologies. And as we develop them, we will, re for example, lithium. There was a mention of lithium. It's true. There isn't enough lithium for all these batteries, but that's a materials problem. There has recently been a discussion of sodium ion batteries as opposed to lithium ion. Sodium is far more plentiful and far cheaper than lithium. These sodium ion batteries are more bulky and consequently they're not uh, uh, suitable for all jobs, but they would be very suitable for renewable backups. And they, don't co they cost a fraction of the lithium batteries and uh, they do occupy more space, but they are uh, perfectly reliable and much more affordable. So all of these questions are questions of experience. The nuclear industry has been subsidized from day one for decade after decade after decade. It's been subsidized for, for 60 years. Uh, renewables really need to uh, take over. Even people who are promoting nuclear, they say it's a transition towards a renewable society. That's what they say. But we are not pursuing the renewables. As you know, Premier Ford, for example, canceled all the renewable contracts and paid $250 million in penalties, rather than, instead is pouring billions of dollars into refurbishing the old nuclear reactors. In New Brunswick, they did refurbish one of those old reactors and it's not working well at all. So let's ask Chris and then maybe a quick response on, on this, just on the, it's related to cost, but then I do want us to go to the safety and, and waste sure. issues, but just specifically on, on the cost, um, are you advocating for uh, what kind of subsidy for nuclear energy? Like the, the, in the recent federal budget, nuclear technology is, is put sort of in a same bucket as far as tax credits with other, other kinds of energy. Uh, what is your position in terms of the cost? What, what, would it, what would it cost the taxpayer if we were to go down the nuclear route? I mean, what, what nuclear needs, what hydro dams need, what any mega project needs is access to low cost capital. And that's why I've been here in Ottawa on several occasions, um, arguing to include nuclear within the green bond frameworks, which is what opens that up. Bonds have built the infrastructure of this country. We're cruising on the infrastructure of this country. We need to build, we need to double or triple that infrastructure. You know, Gordon's saying that you can heat the city of Montreal in the winter, minus 30, minus 40, day long, you know, weeks of snowstorms with um, solar uh, thermal heating, uh, grain, uninsulated grain towers, I guess we'd insulate them. That's not a city I want to live in. It's not a city I want my son to grow up in. It's not a city where I want homeless people or people who are vulnerable or can't afford a backup heating system to live in. Um, you know, I, get, I think that gives you a sense of the seriousness of uh, Dr. Edwards' understanding of, of energy systems. And I think that's unfortunate um, because he is listened to uh, quite well. You know, the issue again with wind and solar is, you know, this backup versus storage debate. Um, what happened in Germany is they had about 100 gigawatts of coal, gas, and nuclear. They built 120 gigawatts of wind and solar, but you can't retire those other 100 gigawatts. So they got rid of some nuclear, they built up some more gas, and they've really kept the coal going pretty flat out. That costs, oh, that's, this is why it costs a lot, because you have to maintain two parallel systems running side by side. It's true that renewables can spare fossil fuel use. You use less of the fuel, but you can't retire those plants like we did here in Ontario. Coal phase outs can be done around the world. It's mostly a gas substitution for coal, like we saw, um, we're seeing in the US and we saw in the UK. Gas is getting a bit difficult in Europe right now, hence the return to coal. But again, we're in this beautiful building. We've got beautiful views. We don't have smog in Ontario anymore because we phased out coal here. And it was nuclear energy that can do it because nuclear provides the same services as fossil fuels, reliability, dispatchability that we all need in terms of keeping our hospitals lit, keeping our homes warm or cool. Um, you know, what, just one other factoid, if you'll allow me. Energy efficiency, absolutely important. Energy rationing, very dangerous. When Japan panicked and shut down its entire nuclear fleet, 30% of their electricity generation, it's estimated that 7,800 elderly people died every year after that as a result of lack of air conditioning. 
So there's a real cost to screwing up on energy, pardon my French there, a real cost in human lives. My hospital, we need 100% reliable energy. My son was in an incubator for five weeks. We can't have a system like that um, where, where there's not that reliability bit in. So it's, it's deadly serious. If we're serious about the electrify everything agenda, then you don't have a backup diesel generator. You don't have a, a propane or a um, natural gas boiler heating your house. That electricity must be ultra reliable or people freeze in the dark or they die of heat exhaustion in the summer. So this is not an issue that we can take serious, uh, we can take, um, sorry, it's an issue that we need to take very seriously. Okay. So, so uh, let's go to the safety issue. And Gordon, you've already referenced the challenge of waste uh, and, and that that is an issue which has not been solved by the, the nuclear industry. What about safety of uh, reactors? If you could just very briefly uh, give your position on safety of, the, of, of that, that uh, source of energy. Well, <clears throat> yeah, the safety of re reactors is connected directly to the radioactive waste. The radioactive waste is what melted down the, the Fukushima reactors, not the malfunction of the reactor itself. The reactors were shut down at Fukushima at the moment the earthquake hit with 9.1 earthquake. They were safely shut down. The problem is you can't shut off radioactivity. And the radioactivity inside the reactor, if it cannot be cooled, then it will overheat spontaneously up to the melting point of uranium fuel which is about twice the melting point of steel. And that's what caused three nuclear reactors to melt down. The releases that came out of that reactor plant were only a fraction of what is inside the plant, what is inside the fuel because of the containment system. But nevertheless, it contaminated an enormous area of uh, Japan. Uh, Chernobyl is a similar situation. Now, those, those radioactive materials, uh, once they get out into the environment, uh, they last for a long time. For example, today you can check radioactive, they're in Germany, in, in the Czech Republic, in Belgium, and in several other countries, um, hunters who kill wild boars cannot eat the meat. And the government actually sends them money to compensate them for being unable to eat the meat because of radioactive contamination with cesium-137 from the Chernobyl accident decades ago. So these, wa these wastes are basically there and any reactor which is bombed or sabotaged in war, like we've seen in Russia invading Ukraine, can release what, it, what the head of the IAE case, IAEA calls a catastrophe. So uh, if we depend upon nuclear power for our future energy supply, spread it around the world, I'm afraid that in any area of conflict, you're going to see massive contamination lasting for generations as a result of conventional war. Okay, let me ask Chris to respond to that specific point of the safety of nuclear waste, particularly in a conflict scenario. Um, so there's a lot to tackle there, as there is in this debate on any topic. Um, it's certainly very worrisome uh, what happened and has been happening in Ukraine with the Russian operation, uh, occupation of the Zaporizhia nuclear station. Um, is it, does that mean that we should not pursue nuclear? I mean, it's interesting, Ukraine's actually signing more deals, wanting to do more nuclear because nuclear offers energy security. Uh, Germany sacrificed its energy sovereignty and couldn't stand up to Russia because it had become so dependent on their natural gas. Energy is complex. The biggest energy disaster in world history was the collapse of the Bankiao Hydro Dam in China. Over 200,000 people died within a week. Okay, so does that mean we should eliminate hydro dams around the world? We should drain all of our hydro dams? I mean, these pose a major threat to population centers around the world. We have to be mature. Again, we need to be like in medicine, talking about the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. You know, radiation is, is a really fascinating topic. Right now, in the next um, one minute, two million ionizing particles will flow through your bodies. Every single second in your body, there are 10,000 radioactive decays occurring from natural sources of radiation. That, that adds up to about 860 million radioactive decays in your body every day, 350 billion radioactive decays over the course of one year. So the world is naturally radioactive. So the question always is, the thing about radiation, it's invisible, but we can measure it down to the decay of a single atomic nucleus. 
there's a lot of atoms in a gram of a substance. We're talking numbers my son uses, daddy, a million, billion, trillion, that kind of thing, right? So we can detect radiation with exquisite sensitivity. The question always to ask folks like Dr. Edwards is what is the dose? What does that compare to? So the average dose that Europeans outside of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia received from the Chernobyl incident was the equivalent of five chest X-rays over 20 years. Five chest x-rays over 20 years. I have parents coming in with toddlers, two-year-olds who bonk their heads, begging me for a CT scan, right, of their brain. That's two uh, millisieverts. That's the equivalent of your entire background dose of radiation, all that natural stuff I just talked to you about over the course of two seconds. So we have really interesting uh, differences in, in how, we, how we approach radiation when it benefits us individually in terms of the medical treatment versus when it benefits us collectively in terms of a coal phase out. That, okay. that coal phase out, by the way, it was estimated by the Ontario Medical Association that coal burning in Ontario costs 1,000 premature deaths every single year, tens of thousands of hospitalizations and emergency department visits. That's what Germany is facing right now. So the kind of complacency, this, I'm getting a bit heated here, and I'm sorry for that, because I really am trying to you know, keep the, the tone we're looking for, but it's an issue I'm passionate about. Air pollution so, so, kills. So, Chris, that that uh, statistic for the radioactivity uh, what, what was equivalent to X-rays five over over th over twenty years. The five over twenty years, and this was the fallout from from the Chernobyl accident Chernobyl. throughout Europe, and then okay. uh, you know, in the mo in the in the effects affected areas outside of the the exclusion zone, the Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians in that area, the equivalent of one full body CT scan over twenty years. Okay, so let's ask. Uh, Gordon to respond right. to this and we are trying to get to the Q&A uh, well, fairly soon so sure. maybe Gordon I could ask that you uh, in addition to responding on that point just make any other quick points that you'd like to okay. uh, ask Chris to do the same to sort of do a yeah. two minute kind of any other uh, things that you want to respond to and then we'll we'll go to the audience so please okay Gordon. well I, I think those latest round of numbers we heard are I mean for, Pardon me, but I think they're hogwash. I think that some, somebody has done a mathematical calculation and come up with that answer. The New York Academy of Sciences published a volume saying that there were over a million people died from Chernobyl radiation. I, I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, point out that uh, these figures that you have consistently brought up throughout this debate about Germany and coal has been extremely unfair and un. Germany started with 85% coal burning around 1960. Over the next few decades, they reduced that to about 50%. Then over the next few decades, they reduced it to 40%, and they reduced it to 31%, which is what you're talking about now. Yeah. It has been a steady decrease, and you have been given this audience the impression that that's the opposite, and that's not true. Just as with climate change, the temperature has little bumps as you go down, and the same thing, if you look at the slide of German coal burning, you'll find that you have little bumps going down too. And the most recent bump was in relationship to the Ukraine-Russia war. And as I said, most of that electricity that they used burning coal at that point was sold to France because their nuclear reactors were not working and was sold to Switzerland and to Austria. It is still going down and Germany has got a commitment to completely phase out coal burning by 2038. And many people think that it will be before then. Uh, they, they made a commitment years and years ago to phase out nuclear by 20, 2022. They extended it by one year because of the Ukraine-Russian war to 2023. They have now shut down them all down. There's no reason to think that their downward trend in coal burning is going to also terminate <clears throat> by 2038. So I don't think it's fair to sort of present to the audience the idea that Germany is ramping up its is coal burning as a result of shutting down its nuclear reactors. That's quite false. Uh, so, I mean, I'm happy, I'm really happy to be fact checked on this and I can get, if anyone contacts me and give you the resources. Uh, Germany reactivated five bituminous coal plants since the Russian invasion and they've extended the operations of two lignite coal plants, no, which I, is the, the dirtiest I, form of coal. There's a beautiful image. You know, they have these, mat, it's the biggest open pit mines in Europe, these lignite coal mines these bucket excavators that move 30, 40 tons in terms of a single gyration of their, of their scoops. They actually had to take down a bunch of wind turbines because they needed the coal from underneath them. 
right? They've knocking down old villages and churches, just consuming, consuming the land. Coal has been going down in Germany. Is that acceptable? Are they climate heroes that they're using it for 31% of their power? We got rid of it in Ontario. We use nuclear. If Germany had made the kind of investments they did in renewables, they be, coal would be gone. Just on the safety point, the, again, trying to get to some kind of common understanding, the million deaths from Chernobyl, can you? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's really interesting. You'll find that there's um, a, a big difference in the mortality estimates out of the Chernobyl data. And you know, as we've seen with COVID, there's a lot of science, scientific literature that you're exposed to. And the question is, what's the quality of that literature? What are the biases that could be present there? So the Yablokov Nestorenko study that Gordon is referencing, it, it was, uh, Yablokov was the founder of Greenpeace Russia. These were two authors. The, the peer review, the New York Academy of Sciences have retracted the paper. The peer review um, was, was, was basically a collection of abstracts, periodicals, and they attributed every excess death since Chernobyl to the Chernobyl reactor in the midst of the Soviet Union collapsing, alcoholism going rampant, the health system falling apart, tuberculosis re-emerging, right? There's several other studies. There's the other report on Chernobyl that was commissioned by a member of the European Green Party, maybe a bit of bias there, three scientists. It attributed about 34,000 deaths to Chernobyl. And then we have a study done by the Chernobyl Forum. This is eight UN agencies plus the participation of Russia, uh, Belarus, and Ukraine. And it says 28 deaths from acute radiation syndrome that my colleague, Dr. Robert Gale, was very involved in treating, and 16 deaths from thyroid cancer so far, okay? There's, there's some modeling on potential future deaths from thyroid cancer up to about 160. Okay, these numbers, when I first read them, I thought this is not believable, but look at the quality of the data, look at the methodology, look at who's commissioning these studies, you know, a lot of the anti-nuclear folks will say, well, that was a conspiracy. Eight UN agencies, hundreds of scientists involved in these consensus decisions. And that's why folks like Dr. Geraldine Thomas, who runs, who is arguably the expert on Chernobyl thyroid cancer is pro-nuclear. It's so paradoxical. I really encourage you to Google her. She's a fascinating science communicator. Um, but, you know, he threw that number out there. So I've got to respond to it, but it's, it's about looking at the quality of the evidence because you should be very confused saying, well, Dr. Kiefer's saying, under 50? That sounds crazy. I've heard a million. Well, I really encourage you to do your own reading as I have read the studies. You know, in medicine now, we're trained extensively in something called evidence-based medicine, critical appraisal, where you look at the quality of the studies and okay, you make so your judgments I, accordingly. I, I suspect there's a lot of people in this room who have read a lot about this topic. So I think we should uh, uh, go to the audience. So just um, uh, the mic, I think, is going to be moved uh, to the side of the room. And uh, so you can uh, go to the bank, you can um, uh, be ready with your questions. And I would ask that you uh, identify yourself and uh, we wanna make the most of this Q&A period. So I'd ask you to identify yourself and state your, your questions succinctly. So go ahead. Thank you very much for the event. My name is Sarah Gabrielle Barron. I'm the nuclear critic for the Shadow Cabinet with the Green Party of Canada. And I'd like some clarification around this idea of radiation that we get it normally from the sun and we're not hurt from it when it comes from you know, x-rays. When the radiation that's coming from the nuclear industry are radio um, nucleides, they are elements that mimic um, the natural elements that we use in our body for, for blood, for energy, for proteins, for, for calcium. And so they're, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So if you could both address that, um, particularly Dr. Gordon Edwards. Uh, well, I'm gonna ask both uh, speakers to address all, all the questions. Uh, so who would like to start on, on, on that one about the nuclei? Uh, uh, Go ahead and then. <clears throat> well, I could start. Um, yeah, the, in a nuclear reactor, there are hundreds of new radioactive materials created, which were never found in nature before 1939. These are oftentimes radioactive varieties of elements in nature, which are not radioactive. Elements like iodine and cesium and strontium, these are found in nature. They're not radioactive, <clears throat> but the nuclear industry creates radioactive versions of these isotopes as a result of splitting uranium atoms, is the broken pieces of uranium atoms. 
And those materials are indistinguishable in the human body uh, from radioactive or non-radioactive. The body has no way of discriminating. And so the thyroid cancers that Dr. Kiefer was referring to are the result of radioactive iodine going to the thyroid gland and uh, causing the cancers. Uh, there are other substances like cesium, which go to the meaty tissues and make food unavailable. It's like, like, for example, the radioactive boars I mentioned, sheep farmers in Wales and Northern England couldn't sell their sheep meat because of cesium contamination. These are not natural radioactive materials. These are materials which are created inside the nuclear reactor. And they're also created inside atomic bombs when they explode. But there's far more in a nuclear reactor than there is in any atomic bomb. So uh, when we talk about natural radiation, it's not at all harmless. Uh, in the United States, they say 20 to 30,000 years, people every year die from radon exposure just in their homes. And it's the number one leading cause of cancer among non-smokers. Even smoking, the, the American uh, Health Physics Society says that up to 90% <clears throat> of the deaths, and there's about 240,000 per year uh, in smokers, is actually due to polonium-210 in the cigarette smoke, a radioactive isotope, which, by the way, that's the same isotope that was used to murder Alexander Litvinenko in London, England. Now that's a naturally occurring radioisotope, but, uh, but we sort of make it more available to the environment through mining uranium, we bring it to the surface and make it much more available. Uh, so there's, there's natural radioactive materials and there's uh, artificial radioactive materials. Nuclear power mass produces a lot of artificial ones, plutonium being just one of the many. Okay. So this is, this is definitely a problem. And I think I'm, I'm amazed that a medical doctor would think that uh, the radiation from a nuclear, from the nuclear waste of a nuclear power plant could be described as anything other than uh, totally un unacceptable for humans. Well, let's, one let's, one let's... fuel bundle, one fuel bundle from a candu reactor coming out of the reactor would kill any human being in 20 seconds at a distance of one meter, simply because of the blast of gamma radiation. That's not normal. Okay, let's let Chris respond then to the safety of that radiation. Okay, a lot, lot to go over here. So first of all, the impacts of artificial versus natural sources of radiation are identical. You cannot distinguish them. Um, in terms of radionuclides versus cosmic rays, um, one of the most common uh, radionuclides in our body that's naturally occurring is potassium-40. It's an isotope naturally occurring of potassium. I mentioned 10,000 uh, decays, becquerels per second happening in your body. 4,600 of those decays are from potassium-40. Uh, that's the most uh, prominent uh, cation inside of your cells, sodium outside, potassium inside. It's all around your DNA. So radiation is everywhere. High doses are dangerous. As Gordon's saying, absolutely don't get near an irradiated fuel bundle fresh out of the reactor. It's, it's really interesting, though, isn't it, that it's so dangerous, and yet in the course of storing spent civilian nuclear fuel, there's not been a single death attributable to radiation in 70 years. It's because we make dangerous things safe, right? So I flew here today in an airplane. I try not to fly, but I think most of us have been in an airplane. You're flying through the sky, 30,000 feet up, 800 kilometers an hour, this little thin tubed, uh, pressurized uh, tube in the sky, right? And we don't give a second thought about that. It's safe. It's made safe because of an enormous amount of human effort and organization, human factors, air traffic controllers, pilot training, 10,000 moving parts on that plane to keep it in the sky properly, perfectly maintained. Handling spent nuclear fuel is far simpler than that. You keep it underwater as you remove it from the reactor. You put it in a spent fuel pool for about 10 years. You put it in a dry cask, a concrete and steel container. The radioactivity, the cool thing about it in nuclear fuel is it undergoes exponential decay. So 99.9% .9 of the radioactivity is gone in 40 years. That's still a high dose. Remember, we started off with extremely high dose. But after about 600 years, the penetrating radiation, the gammas are gone. You would have to crush up the fuel and eat it in order to be harmed by it. Okay, so let's go to the next question. And I think we have the parliamentary secretary at the microphone. So Indeed. please, please uh, go ahead and identify yourself. Thank you. So first of all, so my name is Arif Varani. I'm a member of parliament and parliamentary secretary. So I just work uh, down the road here. Uh, amazing discussion. Thank you for convening it. Um, I want to raise just a couple of points because these are the types of questions that I get asked. Um, 
if you could, and obviously I'm putting this to both of the speakers, if you could give us a comparative example of one can-do reactor and its energy output and what we would need in terms of number of windmills or wind turbines or number of solar panels to match the megawatt output. Uh, so that's the first question. Secondly, if you could compare one can-do reactor and the, let's say it's 200 wind turbines, the carbon footprint in the creation of those two entities, that's an important question. And thirdly, I don't think this, is, this has been discussed thus far, but I hear a lot about the derivative benefits of nuclear, which is nuclear medical isotopes. Uh, and I put that to both of you about what nuclear represents in terms of uh, addressing cancerous cells and medical treatment. Thank you. Okay, Did we, yeah. would you start on that, Chris? Please? Happy to take that question, yeah. So, um, you know, our large CANDU units are about 800 uh, megawatts. Um, most industrial wind turbines are about two megawatts. Uh, some are getting up to five. If we go with two megawatts, we're talking about um, needing or just divide 800 by, by two, uh, 400. Um, now, as we mentioned before, these services of, uh, that a nuclear plant provides of dispatchable, essentially always on electricity, which can be matched to seasonal demand because you do your maintenance and outages when in spring and fall when demand is low and you have them going gangbusters during those hot summer heat waves where wind isn't there, you can't talk about a, an apples to apples uh, replacement. And that's why, again, Germany has been, despite you know, building this enormous fleet of wind and solar, have not been able to kick the coal habit. Um, you, you had a question about medical isotopes. You know, this is one of the spin-off benefits of nuclear in Canada. We basically invented the medical isotope game. After World War II, we had the only large research reactor, and physicians were lining up at the reactor saying, you know, they'd been using radium, which you have to, you know, get out of pitch blend. It's very inefficient. It was $30,000 uh, per uh, gram at the time. We've become a medical isotope superpower, which is, I think, super cool. Let me just give you a couple examples. In our can-do power reactors, which decarbonized Ontario and got rid of coal, we're making an enormous amount of an isotope called cobalt-60. It's used to sterilize 40% of the world's single-use medical devices, right? Things like IV cannulas, endo endotracheal tubes, blood draw tubes, things that we've all been in contact with. So when we talk about does nuclear save lives or cost lives, you know, it's nuanced. I'm not going to say there's no deaths as a result of nuclear energy. The numbers are quite small, but millions and millions of lives have been saved, saved by that sterility. On a personal note, you know, I had to leave my father's bedside. He's in the end stages of metastatic prostate cancer. Um, but one of the treatments he got that extended his life was a radioisotope called lutetium-177. It's really neat. They're tagging these, these atoms, these medical isotopes, to a molecule which will go and bind cancer cells and direct that radiation right where it's needed to kill those cancer cells. So, I mean, this, this issue, again, I'm very sorry that I've been a little bit passionate about it. I really mean to sort of maintain a more calm and upbeat tone of voice, but it means a lot to me. Um, and, you know, in terms of why I'm invested in this, it absolutely has a ton to do with the medical aspects, both in terms of permitting modern healthcare, as well as, you know, the personal benefits I've seen in terms of my father's treatment. Okay, so uh, on the question of the carbon footprint of nuclear versus wind power, Gordon. I, I'm sorry, I'm not equipped to really give you exactly the numbers for that, and therefore I won't venture a guess, but uh, with regard to medical isotopes, medical isotopes are indeed very useful. They were used m decades before the first reactor was ever built, and uh, they will be used decades after the last reactor is shut down, because uh, most of the... Uh, some of the uh, medical isotopes that have been used have been naturally occurring. Madame Curie, for example, used radium, as was mentioned. Um, radon needles are used, for example, for cancers and so on. That's a naturally occurring material. Other radioisotopes are increasingly being produced in, in what are called particle accelerators, cyclotrons. McGill University produced all of its medical isotopes from a cyclotron before it got a small nuclear reactor as well to do that. Uh, but they can still use cyclotrons. They're, they're now using uh, linear accelerators for some of the cancer therapies and for production of isotopes. The fact of the matter is that with the exception of, uh, uh, with cobalt-60 is the only exception that I know of, uh, nuclear power reactors have had no role to play in the production of medical isotopes until very, very recently. They've all been produced in small research reactors around the world. In fact, there were only five nuclear reactors in the world that were producing the whole world supply 
of technetium 99M, the most widely used radioisotope in medicine. None of them were produced in power reactors. So uh, I have a, I've prepared a fact sheet on radioisotopes in nuclear medicine and reactors, and I'll be glad to make it available to any of you. If you drop me a line at ccnr uh, at web.ca, ccnr at web.ca, I'll, I'll send you a copy of that fact sheet. So uh, the fact of the matter is that power reactors and nuclear medicine have had very little to do with each other. Recently, the, some of the power reactor developers, in the case of lutetium-179 in particular, have said that they will start producing medical isotopes, the Bruce reactors, for example. And the reason they're doing this is primarily for public relations purposes. If you look at the literature, you'll find that that is a very good therapy. It's called targeted alpha therapy. Well, in this case, it's beta, yeah. uh, but there's also targeted alpha therapy as well. Yeah. These do not require power reactors. In fact, all the literature, if you read about it yourself, you will see that they recommend that research reactors all over the world could be producing these isotopes. You sure. don't need power reactors for that purpose. Thank okay, you. let's go. Can, to I, can the I just respond to that yes. as the medical professional in the room? Okay, briefly, okay. please. We've got two. So, I mean, Gordon, you're going to have to update your fact sheet because you're quite out of date. Um, I visited the, the McMaster Research Reactor. They produce about 50% of the, of the world's iodine 125, which it's is not a power reactor. I'm not done yet. We need cyclotrons, we need research reactors, we need power reactors. And I'll tell you why in a second if you'll give me the courtesy. Um, so in our research reactors, um, iodine-125, iodine-131, that's great. Iodine-131, again, to treat thyroid cancers, iodine-125 as a brachytherapy, little seeds that we implant in diseased prostate to kill the cancers. Cyclotrons are amazing. Um, and it's great that we're diversifying, right? We did see that issue in 2007 or 2009 with the NRU going down, a similar re reactor in Netherlands going down at the same time. It really choked off the world's supply. So we need to build in that resilience. Cyclotrons have a place, but they can't make certain isotopes, right? They fire protons. So certain isotopes need to be enriched or certain um, atoms need to be enriched with protons. And you can make uh, a group of isotopes that way. But there are a number of isotopes that require neutrons to make. In terms of the role of candor reactors. So lutetium-177 is now a fourth line treatment for metastatic prostate cancer. There are trials going on right now to make it a first line treatment because of how promising it is we are gonna to need to make a lot of that isotope. And that's what candor reactors in particular, power reactors offer to make isotopes at scale. It's true, you can make technetium in a cyclotron. That's the most widely used radioisotope for medical imaging. Um, but um, it's technetium. You, you want, what do you want? This molybdenum, which I'm, I won't get into it too much, but it gives off technetium, which has a much shorter half-life. We've installed uh, molybdenum production at Darlington now, and we can produce about 100% of the world's supply out of that candor reactor. Should that be the sole source? No, because we need resiliency because of what we saw before. So we absolutely need cyclotrons as Dr. Edwards is saying, but they do not replace research reactors or power reactors. And I think the big issue here is we all, everyone in this room, the thing we can agree on is we all hate nuclear weapons. And I think what lies at the base of Dr. Dr. Edwards' desire to rid the world of nuclear reactors, and I, I'm not sure if that extends to medical reactors, you have to clarify, is that this, this idea, if we shut down all the power reactors in the world, the bomb will disappear. Okay, maybe that's not far enough. Let's shut down all the research reactors in the world. Will the bomb disappear? Any student of geopolitics understands that won't occur. So do we need to go to the extent of lobotomizing every nuclear physicist and nuclear engineer because that does put us closer to a bomb in certain circumstances? I mean, this is getting ridiculous, but you see my point. Risks, benefits, and alternatives, and we need to have a mature and nuanced discussion. I, I can understand, frankly, why Dr. Edwards might have those opinions growing up, as my father did, um, during the Cold War with the threat of nuclear annihilation right there, doing duck and cover drills during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But there is a new threat to a new generation that's coming, and that is climate change, and we have to keep all the options on the table. Okay, so we do need to move on with questions, and I'll have to ask you to be brief on the next one, Chris, please, okay? All right, so we'll go to the next person at the, at the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for my English. <laughs> I'm um, a high school exchange student from Italy, so I really apologize if I make any grave mistake in English. Uh, I just wanted to ask to, um, to Mr. Edwards uh, about, you mentioned previously the case of the European pressurized uh, reactor that unfortunately experienced a high cost and uh, times overrun. Uh, my question is, uh, since the APR was a FOAC, so a first of a kind reactor, 
and was one of the first um, reactors to be built in Europe after a few years, I would say decades, uh, of that kind of technology was a generation uh, free plus reactor, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so yeah, all kiloto, Hinkley Point C and um, Flamanville Free experience high cost and times overrun. But is that, uh, my question is, is this uh, a technology problem or is it uh, an over-regulation problem? Uh, they've been built in, let's say 20 years to round, uh, but we experienced Fukushima, uh, the nu Fukushima nuclear accident in between. So regulation has been changed during the building process. So my question is, is this a nuclear technology problem or is this a paranoid over-regulation problem that afflicts the nuclear energy industries in general? Also knowing that one single screw of, uh, of every single screw of a nuclear reactor needs, needs seven certifications. So isn't that a problem of like over-regulation or is it a technology problem? That, that's my question, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I think it's a bit of both, but the thing is that if you look at the record, you'll see that nuclear energy costs have gone steadily up and up and up all the time, and nuclear uh, and renewable costs have gone down and down and down. And in fact, they've gone down every single year. There was only one year in which it went up a little bit, and then it continued to go down. So I think that these costs are related to the nuclear technology because there are so many precautions that must be taken uh, which uh, uh, cannot be tolerated in a nuclear reactor because of the horrendous consequences of making a fundamental mistake in the design of it. And they've discovered that there are... are uh, one other thing about nuclear that I should mention perhaps before anybody forgets about it is that all the materials that go into the nuclear reactor and the core area are some of the best, finest materials in the world, like some of the finest stainless steel you will ever see. And that stuff becomes radioactive waste. It cannot be recycled. It cannot be reused. So uh, this is a problem. Uh, when they build the plant, they want to make sure that it's going to operate properly. And will we have technicians that can build thousands of these reactors as they would mean, need to do if they want to fight climate change? Will we have the skilled workers that have the experience and the necessary knowledge and the necessary quality control to actually build all those reactors safely? In, in the near future. Renewables are a little bit more forgiving. Uh, a windmill is not gonna explode and spread radioactive contamination all over the place. So therefore windmills can be put up and they can be taken down. Nuclear reactors can be put up, they can't so easily be taken down. Okay, Chris, very quick response please on this because and then I'm gonna ask the next two questions and be asked together so that we can. Sure. I mean, we, we Gordon mentioned, uh, you know, the precious materials that go into nuclear construction absolutely should be the highest quality needs to be a lot of regulation there. There's no disagreement there. Um, in terms of um, how he's characterizing this rare elements that need to go into nuclear reactors, that's actually something that better describes the batteries required in wind turbines. Uh, dysprosium, for instance, um, Prasadinium. These are called rare earth elements. They're not rare. They just exist in tiny, tiny concentrations in the earth crust, which means that to mine and refine them, you create a lot of horrific waste from the leaching piles. And interestingly, they're often mixed up with thorium and uranium. And so for every ton of, of rare earth minerals you produce, you generate about a ton of radioactive tailings. So the world is a complex place. Again, risks, benefits, and alternatives. On the material side, a five megawatt wind turbine, 900 tons of steel. It's estimated that you know nuclear e equals mc squared. Speed of light's a big number, square it, that's a big number. What we're doing with nuclear is we're taking that mass, shaving a bit off, and that's released as energy. Um, what that means is you have an extraordinary amount of energy with very little materials required. So you have about six times more mining required for things like wind turbines and solar panels. Mining is devastating. David Howe, amazing UK geologist, says that humans have become such an anthropogenic force on the world that our mining activities move, sift, sort, crush more rock than the oceans, the rivers, the glaciers, and the winds. Think about that. And we're going to pursue, uh, base our energy transition in technologies that require six times more mining. Um, this is a real issue. And again, one of the goals I identify in terms of having the least environmental impact. Okay, so I'm going to ask. Uh, excuse me, I have the, to say something you, about that. Could I have we, to say something about that. Could we I'm maybe sorry. take the two questions? You could answer together. Well, no, together. I want to answer something about that. Specifically on the. Specifically okay, so about that. Twenty the seconds, thing, please. The thing is, the material. What well, the point I was making is, the materials in a nuclear reactor cannot be reused. They cannot be recycled. All the materials used in windmills and solar panels 
can be recycled and can be reused. Right. You don't have to perpetually mine these things. You have to learn how to reuse them. But it is a problem. I don't deny that. And uh, um, Dr. Kiefer has certainly put his hand on a major concern, which is a concern about the mining of minerals in general. But may I please say, and I think it's important to keep a balance here, that the main purpose for small modular reactors for the Ontario government, when they did their first study, was precisely to accelerate the mining of those rare earths that he's talking about. That was the purpose of the mining. And there also has been uh, stated a purpose for small modular reactors is to accelerate the production of uh, dirty oil from the oil sands. So uh, we have to we have to bear in mind that there there are uh, it's not just one side of the coin or the other side of the coin. This mining problem is a general problem that affects all technologies and uranium too. Uh, okay, so we're going to stick with the questions in the in the lineup, please. Uh, so could I ask the <clears throat> next two people to to briefly state your question, and then we'll ask the speakers to address the, the two questions uh, uh, together. So please, next to the mic, go ahead. I'm uh, Audrey Redman. I'm First Nations Dakota from Saskatchewan. I li live in Ottawa. And uh, thank you, Dr. Gordon Edwards, for your presentation. I watched uh, that presentation you gave, gave out of Kenora. And I guess, uh, and thank you, Chris, for being here to um, speak what you have to say. But I think right now, when you're talking about costs, costs, First Nations have paid the costs on this land. And when we talk about energy, we don't really think about how this whole energy crisis started. It started with oil. It went into cars. No, and, and, and no one's talking about what we can do to conserve. What do we do to stop this? And that's the cost to us. It has to be a sacrifice to us. Because right now, when we're talking about nuclear, we're talking about dangers here. We're not here because this is safe. We're all here because we know it's dangerous. And we all know some of the facts. We also know where the costs are going. The government right now is putting big money into this industry. And if we think that what we're doing here is uh, having a freedom of consultation, I think we're just fooling ourselves. Because right now, how much used nuclear fuel will be managed? They put this out. Description of a deep geological repository and center of expertise for Canada's used nuclear fuel. Well, right there, they said the Nuclear Fuel Waste Act, which was passed by the Government of Canada in 2002, requires the WNM nuclear waste management to manage all used nuclear fuel produced in Canada. Currently, Canadian reactors produce about 90,000 used can do fuel bundles per year. If Canada's existing reactors operate to the end of their planned current lives, including planned refurbishments, the inventory of used fuel that will be need to be managed in the facility could be about 4.6 million bundles, depending on future operating experience. The repository will need to be large enough to contain and isolate the inventory, inventory of used fuel from nuclear plants in Canada. Canada's plan was developed for managing Canada's used nuclear fuel. So, you know, this is the costs that are going, that are being put into this to build up this industry. The cost to the lives. And I think that's what really the question is here. Good. In terms of just... Uh, this just, past uh, fall, maybe just, just go in, your, in, tennis, in, in Minnesota, just 400 question, gallons of nuclear uh, runoff 
went into the land. They weren't told about it for three months. This is just down in Minnesota. So right now we're talking about uh, the dangers here. And that's why we're here. Okay, you've, got, talking three, you've about, got three people but, behind you in the question. And I'm, so, I'm sorry, about, but we've got- If we've you got, want to talk we've about got six minutes economy left, so. and you want to talk about cost, yeah. I think maybe you should talk that in terms of uh, the dangers to the lives and Thank really you. what that risk Thank is. Thank you for being here. And, and I'd, I'd ask for- Oh, the, I know, the, the, I, the I next, appreciate the, that. The next, and and we're all here to say something. And I, and I, and yeah. I know that there are many First Nations up in the Northern communities yeah who are really, really concerned right now because they're up there to go and take the minerals. And that's the cost that they're gonna be paying because they're gonna be paying in their lives. Okay, next. Next, next question, if you could please state your question briefly. Um, well, my question, my question is gonna start with a statement. I think it's very presumptuous for, Ms., for Dr. Kiefer to assume that he's the only medical expert in this room. I have been, I have written a book on um, radiation and health, and I have been involved in this issue since 1976. I worked up north in Saskatchewan for four or five years as a uh, emergency physician, and I know fully well what the woman who is just here uh, talks about in terms of the primary effect on the people living where the uranium is brought out of the ground. But the real reason that I started up here to speak was I, I'm not very good in math. So maybe you can say yes or no, uh, uh, Dr. Edwards. Um, I figured out that if we had 410 nuclear power plants in the world producing 10% of the electricity, is that right? Yes. Approximately. Yeah, and then so that means that if we were going to get to 50% of the world's electricity, by nuclear, we would have to build 2,050. Have I got the math more or less right? Okay, so okay, so that, 2,050. The question? the question then is to Dr. Kiefer, where are we going to build those 2,050 and where are we going to find the expertise to do that? Okay, so then I'm gonna ask both of you to respond briefly to both of the of the statements and 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 the the question, and then we'll take the next two questioners and try to end uh, around seven o'clock. So, please. Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, she, she asked me first. But okay. You can go first if you want, Doctor Evans. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, first off, um, I think it's very important to acknowledge um, the history of this country. Um, and the ways in which Indigenous people have every right in the world to be suspicious about nuclear energy, any mega project, any mining project. So first off, thank you for speaking, and I appreciate hearing your voice. You guys are going to find me monotonous, but I'm going to talk again about risks, benefits, and alternatives. So, you know, where Dr. Edwards is from in Quebec, they have very clean electricity, as he mentioned. If they put heat pumps in, they'll have even more. It's wonderful. That comes from their hydroelectricity potential, which is enormous. But let's not forget, 17,000 square kilometers of Cree land was flooded for that project. 17,000 square kilometers. And let's talk about the waste that came out of that. It wasn't waste that was all been contained and stored and has not come out into the environment. It was methylmercury released from that biomass decomposing, accumulating up the food chain, limiting how much country food indigenous people could eat, okay? Let's contrast it with nuclear. I'm not saying one is perfect and the other is not, okay? But I'm just saying risks, benefits, alternatives. We need to understand all the options on the table. Hydro is a backbone of our country's electricity grid and, and of our decarbonization efforts. The nuclear um, footprint from mining to milling to the plants themselves exists on a footprint under 30 square kilometers. That's E equals MC squared for you right there, okay? Has uranium mining been a big issue in the past, particularly on indigenous lands? Absolutely. Have there been a lot of improvements? Absolutely, right? So this is a very complex issue. We need to make, we need to draw a comparison so that we make the best choice, not just consider one thing in isolation. So I offer that okay. to you with respect. Okay. So uh, then we'll have to go to Gordon. I'm sorry, Chris, sure. but we, you'll have, I'll have to ask you both to, to go directly to the, the, the question and yeah. be brief, thanks. Not only have indigenous people suffered the, uh, the uh, indignities and the diseases caused by uh, uranium mining in this country, 
but also they're expected to take the, the high level radioactive waste. I was just up north of Lake Superior talking in Kenora and other communities, including the uh, Wabagoon uh, Ojibwe First Nation. And these people are expected to take the waste, the high level radioactive waste, which remain dangerous for more than 10 million years uh, from the nuclear waste, from the nuclear reactors that provided benefits only to people in Southern Ontario. So there's, there you have a kind of a disparity, a, a justice inequality. When the Royal Commission on Electric Power Planning published its report in 1978 on nuclear power called A Race Against Time, they had a graph in which they showed that one can-do reactor produces one year's worth of spent fuel. How much water would you need in principle to dilute that one year's worth of production to the maximum permissible level of drinking water contamination? And the answer would be approximately um, Lake Superior, the volume of Lake Superior. And the only reason they did this calculation was to dramatize how exceedingly toxic this material is. When I say toxic, this is ingestion toxicity. This is when, when the water gets in through, through drinking water. So we're talking about a phenomenally toxic material. And I think that underplaying the dangers of that material uh, as Dr. Kiefer is trying to do in terms of making a case for nuclear is really not a good idea. And to think that these people up north, these indigenous communities, small, low population at the present time, are expected to accept that uh, because the South wants it, uh, I, I think is, uh, is criminal almost. So we're at seven o'clock. I'm gonna ask Ryan, can we, can we take the three questions at once and finish in five minutes? Is that it? So, so I'm gonna ask the questioners to please state briefly your question. Okay. okay, but I'm gonna ask you, please, given that we're gonna to try to finish in five minutes, we're in overtime already. Please state your name and your question. Yes. And the three of you, and then the two speakers will respond briefly to both of you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I am Jeanette Charbonneau, a nuclear physicist. Um, I think I would ask you to consider seriously the risk of the nuclear waste because it's not only the carbon print, the most risk is the nuclear waste. And I will give you an example. You talk about medical isotopes. I discovered when I was studying the project at Chuck River, you know, the Megadom, that 98% of the radioactivity in the dump will be from carbon 60. Cobalt. Uh, pardon? Cobalt. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, cobalt uh, 60. Yes. Yeah, okay, so, and where does it come from, okay? Radio isotope that were sold across the world, okay? So the company who sold medical radio isotope accept their return in Canada. So Canada is like doing an import of radioactive waste from the medical radio is a top across the world, but it does not benefit Canada, okay? Maybe it is charity for other country, but not for Canada. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll so, ask both to comment yeah. on that question, but, no, but we'll also take the, another two questions and then go to the speaker. Hello, okay. Uh, my name is Nisha. I'm from the Ojibwe Nation of Saugeen, which is located up in Northern Ontario. Um, I traveled to Kenora to go listen to Dr. Gordon Edwards speak. I also uh, stood with uh, the traditional people of Treaty 3. Um, those are the people who are actually, um, we're, we're, being, um, we're being dictated to, to take nuclear waste in our territory. And it's really hard for us people to communicate with the government and all these different people because they refuse to speak to us. They won't take our phone calls. They won't return our, they won't meet with us. I found out about this in 2019 and I've been having a lot of issues and difficulty trying to communicate with the nuclear waste um, with the people. So um, I teamed up with other people. So we created these postcards, um, information postcards. We're from the Environment North and also We the Nuclear Free North. Um, I'm part of the indigenous uh, people from Treaty 3. 
that just wanted to come down here and share with you guys that nuclear waste is not welcome up in Northern Ontario. It should stay down where it's, where it's made. Um, a lot of our elders have spoken against it. Our people have spoken against it, but no one's listening. Um, so I just want to say that the nuclear waste has to stay down in Southern Ontario because we don't want it up north. So, okay. Me watch. Thank you. All right. So la the hi. last question then. Can you, can you, yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'll try to keep this short. Um, so uh, Dr. Kuiper, you've talked a lot about you know, costs, benefits, alternatives, and having to like be mature about this conversation. So I'm trying to do that in my mind and I'm thinking, okay, so we've all, I think we've both agreed that there's no sort of perfect measure, right? Every, whether it's renewable, nuclear, um, there's drawbacks. Um, so I'm doing costs, benefits, alternatives in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so renewables, there's some drawbacks. Uh, we might need, you know, backup uh, generators that might be all might be coal, uh, not necessarily advocating for that, but I understand it's a, it's a reality. Um, but then I look at the cost of nuclears and, and from what I've heard tonight, it just seems like the costs are much bigger when you talk about nuclear, much more dangerous, um, alarming. And I guess I'm wondering, Dr. Pfeiffer, what is your real hesitation with renewables? Is it because you think that they're not um, at a point yet where it could, they could provide the energy that we need? And, as a, and if that is your opinion, um, you know, why not think about also reducing our production, reducing our consumption, becoming a society, an economy that's not um, so focused on internal growth, right? Because um, I think that's also a part of the issue here. We don't just want something that will replace the oil and we do business as usual, right? So it, it, I guess it's sort of a two-part question. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I think it's Gordon's turn to answer first, unless you'd like to see that to Chris, but this will be your last uh, statement, Gordon. So please, there's well, two, are, are two questions around. three minutes conclusion as well, or is that? No, uh, the three minutes of conclusion were from the beginning, and we those were more like two before we went to the Q and A. That was the plan. Oh, so we're not having. Yeah, so questions. this this should be your concluding oh. your concluding statement. So we well, had this two. is my concluding statement. Then I'd yeah. rather not. I think those those questions speak for themselves. I would like to point out that nuclear power, uh, really, what it produces is nuclear waste for ten million years and plutonium for 240,000 years. And you get a little blip of electricity for the first few decades. If you're lucky, maybe 30, 40 years. And then you get radioactive waste forever. Now, uh, what's particularly bothers me, and Dr. Kiefer is correct in pointing this out, is plutonium is not occurring in nature, but we have created repositories of plutonium through nuclear power. Those repositories of plutonium are going to be available for any regime thousands of years in the future to use that plutonium for making uh, nuclear arsenals, nuclear weapons, and so on. The most likely thing that the human race is going to do to destroy itself is, uh, not, is to blow itself up with nuclear weapons. And in fact, through our, uh, through our uh, efforts to keep nuclear technology alive, we have turned a blind eye to the nuclear weapons. You know, we point our finger at North Korea or we point our finger at Iran and all the fingers that are pointing, if we trace them back, they have their own stash of nuclear weapons. So all of them and Canada is doing the same thing. Canada is turning a blind eye to nuclear weapons by not signing the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Why? Because they want to keep their uranium business going. They want to keep the reactor business going. It's business. And in fact, a lot of these companies are really in it for the money. They think they can sell. They think they can grab a lot of cash from the government. And if they're, any, if they're lucky, they might be able to sell them around the world and make a lot of money. But nuclear weapons, in fact, which is another existential crisis of the human race, are being ignored in the process. I believe that the two are inextricably linked and that you should be very cautious about what you ask for because what you get may be very different from what you're asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. So Chris, and your and and please uh, just two minutes, which is the same amount of time Gordon just spoke for. And please, if you could answer that last specific question, what is your hesitation around renewable energy? 
Um, I think I've been pretty clear in terms of the limitations of renewables. Um, and I'm speaking here specifically of weather dependent renewables. I think hydroelectricity is great. I think geothermal has a lot of promise, but as I mentioned, wind and solar require backup. That backup is natural gas and coal, unfortunately. Um, batteries are seconds to minutes kind of resources in terms of energy storage. Um, I do wanna to respond to the question about the cobalt 60. Um, so, I mean, I think it's wonderful that we're permitting um, medical procedures in poor countries as well. Cyclotrons are not affordable in Africa, for instance, that cobalt 60 is used in external beam radiation in poor countries. Um, the waste has a short half-life. So in 50 years, that, that uh, cobalt 60 is 99.9% .9 nickel. I think that's something that we can do for the world and we should be very proud that we do for the world. And it's a very manageable problem. In terms of the scourge of nuclear weapons, the very interesting story here, uh, the megatons to megawatts program, 20,000 um, warheads worth of highly enriched uranium came out of Russia at the end of uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, was negotiated with the Americans, was down blended into reactor fuel, brought to America and provided 10% of US electricity. This is the ultimate weapons swords to plowshares story. And this is an example of the ways in which these technologies are linked, not necessarily in the way that Gordon thinks. I'll just close again by saying that we all don't want nuclear weapons in the world. However, where Gordon and I differ is that I don't think that shutting down all of the good things about nuclear, our coal phase out, our lack of smog days, our medical isotopes, we haven't even got into um, the material science that Canada has been responsible for. You know, the airplane I came on, every single turbine blade and every jet engine made in North America goes through neutron beam radiography at McMaster uh, Research Reactor. There's so much to this sector. Um, we can't put the genie back in the bottle, unfortunately. I wish it was as simplistic as that. But I also don't wish it was as simplistic as that. Like, the world's a complex place. I'm really glad my dad got state-of-the-art medical care with medical isotopes. All right, well, a big thanks to both of our discussants here. Thank you both for being here. I hope that you have found this illuminating. I hope you are inspired to go and learn more and read more about this topic as you've been encouraged to do by our speakers. And I'd like to thank you very much for being here with us tonight. Merci beaucoup.